Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Healthcare. I'm very pleased to introduce a very special co-host with me today, and that is Brittany Buthis. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Joining us today to talk about the flu vaccination and the shot is Dr. Chris Redstead with the newest Healthy Stillwater Clinic. Thank you for being with us. Thanks Dr. for having Redstead. me. Well, Doctor, before we talk a little bit about uh, flu vaccine, maybe you can tell us about yourself and about the Healthy um, Stillwater Clinic there. Uh, I'm a family physician. I just recently moved back to the area. I'm actually originally from uh, northern Minnesota up in Hibbing. My wife's from Apple Valley. I've uh, been with the military for the past 20 years, uh, 12 of which have been a family physician for them. And uh, recently served my commitment and time with them, and we decided to come back with our family to Minnesota. Uh, interviewing with the different uh, organizations, uh, I was lucky enough to be selected with Health East and uh, started working for them. And we just opened a brand new clinic in Stillwater, uh, which we just opened a week and a half ago. Uh, great new clinic, new outlying, new. Uh, exam room, new facility type uh, that they're using in some other areas around the country and we've decided to bring that here uh, to Minneapolis now. In St. And Paul. where is that located in Stillwater? In Stillwater it's off of Curvecrest Boulevard right at the right at the intersection of uh, 5 and 36. And why did you want to work at the Stillwater Clinic? Oh it's a beautiful clinic in the town of Stillwater. I, I come from northern Minnesota, a very small town. Uh, I grew up with a family physician. We didn't have a lot of specialists. And that was the reason I actually became a family physician. And in Stillwater, that's the type of community I'm used to. The small rural community, the community binds together and helps, them, helps themselves out. Uh, it has a nice small town feel, yet we're also located in a place that the amenities of a larger city are, are nearby. Well, Stillwater is a beautiful community. Oh, very beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about the flu vaccination? And I understand that it covers three different strands and kind of the differences between the three different kinds of flu? The differences in the flu uh, vaccines and the types of uh, flu viruses that are in it, basically when you look at it, the, the flu has its common symptoms that come with it. And all three of them that are in there and just the flu strain in general all cause the same symptoms and infect the same place in the upper respiratory area. The strains that are in there are, there are different strains of it. So the current vaccination that's being used this year is the same one that was actually used last year. It uh, has the H1N1 strain in it, which uh, we all, the other name for it that kind of grew into fashion, I guess, was the swine flu, but it is the H1N1. Plus there's a H2N2 or H2N1 uh, variant in there plus there's one it's called a B series. The the difference between it, like I said for the individual person the flu is the flu when you get the symptoms that's what you have. By covering those three different strains we cover the types of flu that we found prevalent throughout the world. The, the, the World Health Organization and the CDC actually track the flu globally every year and actually track the different strains of them to try and figure out and predict what strains, what are the major strains that are going to be hitting the U.S. Uh, the flu normally hits between October, and the flu season usually goes through about uh, February or March time frame. And so it's kind of a predicted guess of what's going to come to us. Uh, and that's where we got those three strains that we're currently using. Who's at greatest, the greatest risk for getting the flu then? The people at the greatest risk, so everybody can come down with the flu. The, the people who are at greatest risk for having complications from the flu are the, one, are the individuals that we put in the high-risk category. And those are individuals over the age of 50, people who have chronic diseases, especially chronic respiratory diseases such as asthma, COPD. Uh, they've had a heart attack or some sort of a heart condition. Uh, those that have chronic kidney or liver problems, uh, those individuals as well that are immunocompromised because they're on medicines that decrease their immunity, uh, such as those people who have cancers uh, or HIV, uh, and then children under the age of five are also at a greater risk. The other people that are at risk, and they may not realize it as much, is people who smoke, people who fall into the medical mm. category of more of, uh, morbid obesity, and that's where your body mass index is above 40. Uh, an easy way to define it is if you take an average height male, which is between the heights of 5'8 and 5'10, if they weigh 275 pounds or more, or the average size female in America, which is around 5'8 
six to five eight if they weigh above 240 pounds, that also puts them at risk for having complications from the flu. And so those are the high risk individuals. And then anybody in contact with those individuals, because if you have the flu, you can carry it to them, are also considered high risk. And that would be maybe healthcare workers and things like healthcare that? Healthcare workers, um, really just about everyone, especially in the United States. How many people are not in contact with somebody that falls into those categories at some point mm -hmm. during their day? We also like those, in, those uh, individuals uh, immunized as well to prevent them being able to pass it to somebody else. You know, it seems like I've been hearing um, some cases already early, and it seems fairly early for me, um, of cases of upper respiratory type, sudden flu sounding type symptoms. Are you seeing that in the clinic as well? Yes, uh, we are into the season now, and usually lighter cases now, and they'll start growing as, uh, as winter comes around, the heaviest season. As I said, it goes between October and March. Um, November, December, usually a little bit higher time frame. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's during their winter months, which is, uh, starts in May and goes through June, uh, or May through October, and now mm -hmm. for us, October on through. And uh, yes, we're starting to see it. The flu, a little bit different than most viral infections. Uh, I mean, almost every viral infection is going to cause a fever, which is where you have a temperature above 100 degrees. Uh, most viral infections though, especially the upper respiratory, that fever only lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. With the flu, that can go from about two to five days in length. Uh, plus you get the headaches, muscle aches that go with it. Uh, with the elevated temperature, you get dehydrated. Um, and some people will get a cough and a sore throat with the flu as well. And I think oftentimes people say, oh, I had um, vomiting in that, and that's not associated with the flu. Those are other type of those are usually other types. It's yeah. some influenzas, you can get some mild vomiting. Uh, usually that comes from the dehydrated, the dehydration portion of it and why we're so, when you get it, yeah, make sure you're drinking plenty of water. What's the difference between the flu shot and the nasal spray vaccine? Uh, in the way that uh, they're delivered. Number one, the way they're delivered. The, the injectable that we give through the muscle is a inactivated virus. So there's not a live virus inside there. It's Which the, means you can't get the flu from the flu you shot. You can't get the flu shot. Will you have muscle aches around where we injected it? Will you feel slightly fatigued, maybe even have a mild fever for eight to 24 hours after getting it? Yes, uh, we're trying to stimulate the immune system. The immune system gets stimulated. You get mild fevers, you get achiness. It's your body's response to something foreign being in the system. But there's no live flu inside of it. The nasal spray is a live attenuated virus. So we've killed the majority of it off, but there is some live virus still inside of there uh, that, you are, that you're getting. And it has the same side effects that the, the injectable has, but then it has a couple other extra ones in there, such as, well, it's inhaled through the nose. So sore throat, congestion, a little bit more of a headache than you'll get with the, the one that we inject, the shot. And because it's also a live attenuated viruses, a virus in there, there are some people we don't want to receive that, such as those who are pregnant, if they are immune compromised, such as HIV, or have a malignant cancer, if they have diabetes, or some sort of a respiratory uh, chronic illness, such as asthma or COPD. Uh, the nasal one is not meant for them. It's mainly for the age categories of 19 to 49. Okay, so if somebody is to get the flu then, what's the best way to treat it or when should they kind of go and seek further treatment from their clinic or hospital? Uh, treatment for it is symptomatic care. In other words, uh, we have a couple medicines out there that can help treat the flu, but really they're for the people who are at more risk of developing complications. Uh, and they really don't shorten the course of the flu at all. It's usually about two to five days. You can have muscle aches and fatigue for up to two weeks from it fevers for about two to five days, uh, is symptomatic care. Make sure you stay hydrated, drink plenty of fluids. Use Tylenol or ibuprofen or acetaminophen to keep the fevers down and to help reduce the risk. Don't use aspirin, uh, especially in people 19 years and younger. Don't use aspirin or aspirin-based products. Like I said, some people can get a mildly upset stomach. One thing to be aware of is Pepto-Bismol and other uh, 
anti-nausea medications or stomach settling medications actually have aspirin inside of them. I was not aware of that. Yeah. So those shouldn't be used in, in people underneath the age of 19 either. Uh, hydration, rest. Your body's going to be tired. It's fighting, it's fighting off a virus. So give it rest. Relax. Take a couple days off. Recoup. And you'll be able to go back. Now, during that, when should you go and see your provider? Well, if you're starting to get shortness of breath, if the fever is going beyond five days, or if you notice that you can't keep enough fluid in, okay, you're getting severely dehydrated, one of the ways to tell is when you do go to the bathroom, check the color of your urine. It should be a light yellow to clear. If it's turning dark yellow or brown, you need to seek medical attention. In children, some other things to watch for is with their breathing. Uh, are they having to, a lot of times kids can't tell you. Well, if you notice when they're breathing that as they suck air in, the skin is collapsing between the ribs. Or if they're grunting when they breathe, or they're having periods where they're not breathing, you need to seek medical attention mm -hmm. quickly. What about um, the pneumonia? I know that there's a vaccine available for that. Who should be getting that? That's also something that is very prevalent during the winter months as well. Yes, it is. And now there's about there's three different actual vaccinations for pneumonia. Two that we use here in the United States. One is with their normal childhood immunizations, and that was actually known as PCV13. Uh, otherwise, uh, brand name one of the brand names for it is Prevnar. Uh, that's actually given with their with your childhood immunizations. It's a series of four. Now there is another vaccine that we call the pneumococcal, which is uh, PCV23. And there are some high-risk individuals for that, usually 19 and over. Number one, anybody over the age of 65, we actually want them to get that. There's actually been some great studies showing that if they receive that immunization and also their flu vaccine, it significantly reduces their chance of having pneumonia, and especially having a pneumonia which they end up admitted to the ICU or end up dying from. Uh, if you're over the age of 65, it's a one-time shot. If you have some chronic illnesses, and your doctor will tell you if you need them or not, such as you've had your spleen removed, uh, again, chronic respiratory, kidney, or liver diseases, or cardiac diseases, we'll want you to get it earlier. Um, and then every once in a while, a booster that goes with that. Okay, so you would recommend then, or wouldn't oh, yes. recommend for children for, to get the pneumonia vaccine? Yes, I yeah. would recommend, oh yes. Uh, vaccines are, it's actually pretty interesting when you look back at the research of it. When the pneumococcal vaccine first came out, it was actually back in 1945. It came out at the same time aspirin did. 1945, 1945. wow. 1945, excuse me, same time, not aspirin did, but same time penicillin did. Okay. And uh, interestingly enough, they found out that it worked. But mm -hmm. penicillin came out on the market. And because they had an instant cure for it, they decided not to use the vaccine. And it wasn't until the 1970s and 1980s that we started seeing resistance to penicillin and other antibiotics to the pneumonia that we finally came back to the vaccines. Because we found if we can get the body to generate its own response to it, it is much more successful than our antibiotics are. And are there possible side effects from vaccines? Yes, we are stimulating the immune response. After you get a vaccine, will you feel slightly feverish? Will you have some mild aches? Will you have pain around the injection site? Yes, you will. Uh, but in the risk-benefit ratio, the benefits of the vaccine so outweigh any risk that may come from it that, yes, vaccinations are How miracle. old should children be if they get the pneumonia vaccine? Well, as I said, they're already getting the pneumonia vaccine okay. uh, through their normal routine childhood okay. immunizations. And, and hopefully they're getting those. Yes, yeah. they're getting those. Okay. And uh, that's also part of the state program in which a mm -hmm. uh, child, it's one of them that's checked for as they start school to make sure mm -hmm. that they've had it. So they're already getting it. Uh, the others who need the additional pneumococcal vaccine, uh, usually they have some other chronic illness that goes with it, and their physician should be talking to them about it. The largest group that we actually miss on are the 65 and over population that are not getting it as they again enter into that higher risk side of it. And quite a few of them maybe don't go see their provider on an annual basis or the last time they went to see them they were 59 and I'm doing fine, why do you need to go see a doctor? Mm -hmm. But about age 65 is when we want to give that vaccination again to prevent things later. And I understand if you're hospitalized too, that they will ask if you've had your flu shot, 
pneumonia shot, and they will give you those in the, during your hospitalization as well then. Yes, and I know in the clinic uh, that I'm in right now, and all the healthiest clinics as well, uh, now that we have the flu vaccine available, you come in for an appointment, we're going to ask you if you'd like to get it today. Uh, there's very few things that we, you know, you come in even for a sprained ankle or maybe even a slight cold, you can still get the flu vaccine at that point. There's, you know, there's a couple of cases where we'll say, yeah, you know, your temperature's up a little bit, maybe you shouldn't get it today, why don't you come back in a week? But we have that available now as to most clinics and as you come in, we'll be offering it. You know, talking about those childhood immunizations, one of them that they immunize against is measles. I'm old enough that I actually got the measles <laughs> before that, that was around. But we recently had some outbreaks here in Minnesota of some children who got very, very ill with measles, hadn't gotten their measles immunizations. What advice do you have for parents? Uh, that uh, it came to be an unfortunate case. There are areas in the world that are still have endemic measles, and we do give the vaccinations starting at uh, six months uh, to children. It can be given earlier in life, but measles is not that common in the United States. Uh, there are some other areas in the world that it is endemic to, and they do, so they actually give it at an earlier age. Um, and as this outbreak happened, it was somebody who was not vaccinated from another country that came to the U.S. and their child, their child had the measles when they came in. Uh, luckily, we've been able to identify that area and uh, treat the children and actually get their vaccine, the, the children that are in the United States, get their vaccine a little bit earlier to prevent that from happening. But that also brings up a point, if you're traveling, we give our immunizations based on what is most prevalent in the United States, okay, from an age-based range, um, and as do the other countries. So if you are traveling outside the country, now Canada gives their immunizations about the same time we do, but if you're going somewhere such as Africa, Europe, South America, really you should go see your provider beforehand because we might need to give immunizations a little sooner uh, because you're going down to those areas. Uh, that have these, plus there's other diseases in those areas that we just don't find in the United States, malaria, um, typhoid fever, uh, a couple others that we can actually help prepare you uh, before you go down there to make sure that you don't come in contact with them or if you do, be able to treat you sooner to prevent all the complications that can happen from them. Yeah, great advice. Going back to the flu and pneumonia, um, I have cousins that I've cared for that have gotten RSV. And I know that's something that kind of comes in the winter months. What exactly is that and what should parents know about that? It's a virus, a lot like the flu. Unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine for it yet. Uh, but it's the respiratory succincture virus it's where we get RSV from. And it infects the, not the small, small vessels of the lung where the air exchange happens and not the large areas, but the area in between that transports the oxygen in and out from where the actual oxygen and blood exchange happens. Uh, it caused an inflammation in there and some mucus to build up. It's a very common virus. Um, we as adults actually come down with it as well from time to time. But uh, those children under six months of age, and especially under three months of age, uh, it can affect them more than us. There are different things to watch for. Like the flu virus, you'll see a temperature elevated. And if they're under the age of three months and you see a temperature above 100 degrees, you should be seeking uh, medical advice. Give a call. If they're above three months and the fever is lasting longer than 72 hours uh, with a cough, again, seek medical advice. Most children will go through it without a problem. Now, if you happen to see wheezing, if you see grunting, just like with the flu, where they're having trouble breathing or periods where they're not breathing, and especially if they start turning uh, pale or bluish in color, you need to seek immediate uh, medical care at that point. The treatment for it is just supportive. Usually we give them oxygen, uh, moistened air oxygen, and some medications to help open up their airway uh, while their body fights off the infection. So our children, like I know my cousins in particular, were premature. Um, so are they at greater risk because of a weaker immune system then, or? Yes, uh, okay. those under the age of three months, children that were born before 30, 35 weeks of age are at a greater risk for it. And also children that are born with uh, uh, other respiratory problems, such as asthma, uh, the prematurity, as we already discussed, or if they live in a household of smokers. Uh, that, too, 
that, that secondhand smoke irritates the lung, the lung linings, and in a newborn infant, that's very irritating to them. And they get a normal virus that other kids are able to fight off, they're already fighting something off. It makes them a little more susceptible to needing medical care to be able to get through that illness. Okay. Are there any final comments or anything that families should know with the upcoming flu season and how they should prepare for their households? One of the best ways is A, get your flu shot, get your flu vaccine because with it you may still get the flu but it actually reduces how long you'll have it and also reduces your ability to transmit it because your body's able to fight it off quicker. So definitely get your flu vaccine. It's one of the best things you can do for it. The other is uh, basically hand washing. Uh, when you cough or sneeze, we actually try to recommend people don't sneeze into your hands, go into your elbow, mm -hmm. okay? Nobody shakes your elbow, they shake mm -hmm. your hand. Mm -hmm. So if you need to sneeze or cough, cough into your elbow after touching your mouth, if you're feeling a little under the weather, and anytime you touch your mouth, your eye, your nose, make sure you wash your hands uh, before contacting other people. Uh, stay hydrated and uh, enjoy life. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> great advice. So if um, our viewers would like more information about, uh, about um, the Healthy Stillwater Clinic, the number is on the screen, that's 651-471-5600. And uh, Dr. Rested will be happy to talk with you without yes. further advice. So thank you so much for being with yeah. us. Thank, thank you. you so much, Chris, and thank you for telling us about the new clinic that you're at. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank um, last month, as we mentioned, St. John's Hospital is celebrating 100 years of caring for families in the Twin Cities East Metro. There we are. So um, we have put together a video that we thought you'd find very interesting about the, a little bit about the history of St. John's. Take a look. was a time when steamboats and railroads linked St. Paul with the rest of the country. It was a time of economic boom at our state's capital city, a time of tremendous growth and expansion, of new roads with streetcars, and of the creation of a new park system. A time when diverse neighborhoods in St. Paul grew, horse-drawn buses took our children to school, and small grocery stores seemed to pop up on just about every corner in St. Paul. And on St. Paul's East Side, 1911 was also when St. John's Hospital opened its doors for the very first time with 25 beds. It was St. John's German Lutheran Hospital to start with, um, it, and it was certainly developed at a time when you know, different nationalities were creating their, their own, own hospitals. It wasn't long before St. John's built a brand new 65-bed fireproof modern hospital at the site of the current Metro State College. Three years later, in 1918, when the flu epidemic hit, St. John's Hospital turned its beds over to the city to charity care for the sick and dying. In one month alone, doctors treated nearly 400 flu patients. During the Great Depression, St. John's experienced its all-time low with just 18 patients, and the hospital was forced to close some hospital floors. But by 1946, on the hospital's 35th anniversary, it was debt-free and the mortgage was burned. St. John's continued to grow and expand through the 50s and 60s, expanding to 165 beds and was known nationally for its innovative progressive patient care. There was a special section of the Saturday Evening Post uh, back in the 60s that touted this model that St. John's was developing. By its 50th anniversary in 1961, St. John's Hospital was one of the most popular hospitals in the Twin Cities East Side, and St. John's was bursting at the seams. St. John's growth continued through the 70s and 80s. Well, we were 348 beds, I believe, when, when I first started. And there were days during the winter when, um, you know, we had patients in the hallway. I mean, they just there, there weren't enough beds to support everything. And St. John's programs were gaining national attention, like the volunteer program, which received a White House honor by then President Richard Nixon. We created the junior volunteer program. We began taking uh, we kept track of the hours that the kids put in. 
we did a lot of history on them so that when they were going for either scholarships or <clears throat> being accepted in a certain field, because we had the records and how good they were, it helped them a great deal. In 1985, St. John's built a state-of-the-art hospital at its current Maplewood location. The following year, St. John's joined other faith-based East Metro hospitals to form the Health East Care System. From the very beginning, St. John's has always been a leader in health care and continues to be so today as the first community hospital in the Twin Cities to offer a robot-assisted surgery to treat prostate cancer patients. All the way through, uh, there was innovation. There was always forward thinking, and uh, I guess that's the thing that's been exciting. At the heart of St. John's century of tradition are the dedicated nurses, physicians, and staff who have been caring for patients in St. Paul and the Northeast Metro for 100 years. I think the, uh, the combination of its faith-based heritage and, and the employees, it's a long-tenured group of, of staff, and they provide excellent care, and, and that's the business we're in, is giving care to patients, and that's where the rubber meets the road. So I think it's the employees in the end that make such a difference. Thanks to our dedicated staff, St. John's has been named one of the top 100 best places to work in healthcare in the country by Modern Healthcare Magazine, and one of the best places to work in Minnesota by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal, and one of the top metro hospitals in the Twin Cities by U.S. News and World Report. Over the last hundred years, just a uh, enormous responsibility to our community to provide high quality care, safe care, and I'm just so proud of what we've been able to do over the history of St. John's. A history dedicated to our community and the people we serve. It was just another example of how compassionate and caring and comforting everybody that I, that I touched um, in that kind of surround sound of, of care. A century of caring. I can't imagine a better care than what I've received from, from the first day and, until, until now. A century of quality care. To everyone at St. John's, happy 100th anniversary. I'd like to thank St. John's for inviting me to celebrate with the donors, supporters, and employees, the best employees in the area. Thank you all for providing our community with quality, comprehensive health care. And I know that St. John's will remain an anchor in our community well into the next century. Congratulations once again and thank you for your service to our community. May you continue to carry St. John's tradition of excellence through the next 100 years. For the people in our state who rely on your services, you are a source of comfort and a beacon of hope. Your hospital and the entire Health East Care Network is part of the reason Minnesota has emerged as a national model for quality health care. You should all be enormously proud of that, and I want to thank you for your great work, not just on behalf of your patients, but for the whole community. Congratulations on your 100th anniversary. Congratulations again on 100 years. It's, uh, it's pretty special. I'm very thankful and appreciative uh, for everyone who's played a part in the history of St. John's and who will be playing a part uh, for the future of St. John's. Well, that's our program for you, and I'd like to thank my very special okay. co-host here, Brittany, for joining us, and she's a thank recent you. graduate of Minnesota State University at Mankato. We wish her all the best in her career, so thank you, Brittany. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been great. <laughs> thank you so much, and we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone. Inside Healthcare. For more information, visit St. John's Hospital MN.org or call 651 326 7800.